All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the fourth session um, of the certificate program in practice-based research methods. Uh, this is a virtual session and is facilitated by the Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared, a network of virtual training series funded by the AHRQ. Uh, this gives you live access to live and archived access to all sessions as part of the certificate program. Uh, the certificate program is developed by Dr. Jim Warner in partnership and the support of eight AHRQ funded PBRN counter uh, uh, <laughs> PBRN uh, centers of excellence. I apologize. Uh, just some housekeeping for today. If you are having any problems with your audio, please click on the audio uh -huh. wizard at the top. Um, and if you are joining us via phone line, please be sure to mute your phone and use the raise your hand uh, button if you do have a question. Uh, you can also type into the chat room. Uh, the raise your hand button is located in the participants box under your name. It's the third button to, uh, towards the uh, right which is a, it's a small hand. So now at this time, I will pass the presentation over to Dr. Jim Werner. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to uh, present um, and introduce our uh, speakers for today. Uh, we're going to be talking about recruitment, engagement, and retention in PBRNs. Uh, these two speakers have a, a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge and wisdom about doing practice-based research. And they're um, L.J. Fagnan and Melinda Davis. So first I'll introduce uh, Dr. Fagnan, L.J. Um, he's been involved in practice-based research for a very long time, uh, was one of the founder, founding practices in the Ambulatory Sentinel Practice Network, ASPEN, um, and uh, was selected in his practice uh, back in 1977, the Dunes Family Practice, as a model rural practice by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Rural Practice Project. Um, and then Dunes was uh, one of the, as I mentioned, uh, practice number 29 in the uh, Ambulatory Sentinel Practice Network, one of the um, foundational networks in the United States in doing PBRNs back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. He joined the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University in 1993, and then in 2002, LJ founded the Oregon Rural Practice-Based Research Network, which is um, still going very strong. He directs one of the ARC P30 centers um, called Metalark, M-E-T-A-L-A-R-C, and the Meta Network, it's the uh, Meta Network Learning and Research Center. His Research portfolio includes studies and publications related to population-based health, dissemination, and implementation of evidence-based medicine into practice, quality improvement, and rural health care systems. And he's uh, one of the directors of the of the certificate program with me. Um, so it's a it's a real privilege to have LJ speaking with us today. Also speaking today is Dr. Melinda Davis, and Dr. Davis uh, spent four years um, in Frontier, Eastern Oregon as a Practice Enhancement Research Coordinator, or PERC, and you heard about PEAS the last time, Practice Enhancement Associates. This is somewhat similar to that, so she has real on-the-ground expertise, a lot of experience in actually making practice-based research happen and working with practices. Um, she's completed her PhD uh, recently in social and developmental psychology and accepted uh, a faculty position as research assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, where both he, uh, she and LJ are both located. She's currently funded on the ARC Patient-Centered Outcomes Research PCORI uh, K-12 Career Development Award and is using using pragmatic coaching to identify, tailor, and implement evidence-based interventions for colorectal cancer screening um, into Oregon's regional coordinated care organizations. She has a lot of expertise in using participatory research approaches, mixed methods designs, um, and focuses on improving the health, health and healthcare delivery in rural and underserved communities in primary care settings. 
uh, her research agenda, because she has been so in touch with practice as um, a practice enhancement research coordinator, her research has been shaped by local needs and has addressed topics including childhood obesity, behavioral health care, unmet dental needs, care management for patients with multiple chronic conditions, and evaluating strategies for supporting practice change. So we have two um, uh, exquisitely uh, qualified uh, speakers today to talk about this topic. So LJ and Melinda, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, so I'm going to have Mel Melinda's going to lead off for us. That was obviously LJ's voice. This is Melinda Davis. And uh, just for context, you can't see us in the video, but if you could, you would also see Liz Waddell, who's one of the, the fellows in the program in the room with us, as well as Beth Summers, um, who's one of our current practice facilitators, and Emily Turnside should be joining us shortly. Um, what, what we're going to try and do in today's session is we, we heard a little feedback that um, it would be nice if there was more opportunity for some interaction in these sessions, if the articles that were assigned, if we could clearly kind of identify key points from those articles, and also if we could provide some time for conversation so the fellows could share. So to get started, I really want to do a little mini test run to see how, how well you guys can actually use this uh, collaborative system. So if you're out there listening, would you just raise your hand? So raising your hand, yeah, awesome. Okay, good. Yeah, oh gosh. Okay, there's a few at the bottom. So raising your hand is the, the hand sign that appears at the top of the participant listing. Okay, so when you raise your hand, it immediately puts a number, you can probably see it, puts a number and moves you around in the queue. So go ahead and take your hands down unless you really do have a question. Okay, the other thing is you can always see down in the chat box, there's space to type. And what we've, we've charged Amanda with today is really monitoring that chat box and trying to interrupt us if there are questions or cues or prompts that, that maybe you don't feel comfortable jutting in there, but you really want to get out. So please feel free to um, interact with us throughout this presentation. And we'll have some time at the end both for a panel for sharing as well as some facilitated conversation. So the goal really of our se session today is to give a really brief contextual background for why research is happening in PBRN and how some of the work of PBRNs is now expanding beyond clinic walls and how, that, how that's related to kind of a changing culture of, of practice as well as a changing research agenda. And then really to focus on these strategies to engage clinicians, staff, and other stakeholders in, in the research process. Then we structured the presentation, so there will be some didactic lecture, but hopefully we'll move pretty quickly into our panel and then some time for discussion and feedback. So if you are out there multitasking today, I would encourage you to jot down some notes about what you're actually thinking about doing for, for the research project required through this training, and then to engage with us and the other experts on the phone today. Um, so, in terms of knowing who is out there today, would you raise your hand again if you are a fellow who's on the call? Liz is raising her hand in the room here. All right. And then raise your hand if you are a mentor who's on the call. Put your hand down if you're a fellow and raise your hand if you're a mentor. All right. So we've got a number of fellows and a few mentors. So Jim and Rowena, we might be calling on you to share your expertise because we know you have a lot to offer as well. So diving in, I wanted to flag, so there were a few must-reads, there are three must-reads that we emphasized that really kind of highlight the changing nature of practice-based research and why uh, clinicians um, might consider participating in practice-based research as well as some of the tensions and we'll highlight key findings from those readings throughout the lecture. Um, there were also a number of optional readings we flagged. Um, and these, I would just say, if you're, if you're writing an application, you might want to dig these out to cite them in your application at that time. So hopefully they'll provide useful, useful then. 
So I'm going to turn it back over to LJ, who, as you heard in the introduction, has, has kind of been a legend in terms of practice-based research being one of the initial, initial sites. And we'll let, him, we'll let him share a little bit briefly, because we know you've already heard this, about the history of practice-based research. Uh, so uh, this, this LJ, I'm really glad to be here. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's exciting to, to share this, and the description of being a legend means you're old. <laughs> and uh, that's the, the, inter the translation of, uh, uh, of that. And, you know, I know you've heard about this question. Why did PBNs emerge as a setting for research? And so you're going to hear about it probably each time uh, one of us gets an opportunity to talk about our work and what we do. There are a variety of topics uh, that are in the syllabus there. But I actually think it's useful. Uh, to hear the, the, the different perspectives, because there, there, there is a little variation on, on them. And, uh, and so uh, I'm assuming I can just. You've got to go up to the arrows at the top. Oh, i got to go up to the arrows. Melinda's telling me how to run this here. And so this one's really, uh, really says, this is really hard work uh, to get research that's relevant into day-to-day -day practice. And I think it's incredibly important for us uh, uh, to do that. And that's, what, uh, that's what's happened when we kind of thought about just kind of things diffusing from the ivory tower out to the community. It really takes a long time and not much of it reaches day-to-day -day practice. And as a result, uh, our patients in our practices are really not getting the care uh, that uh, has been recommended uh, on, on the basis of, uh, of evidence, and so uh, we we want to change we want to change that. And uh, uh, so this is uh, you've seen that triangle, uh, the car white triangle from 1961, mm -hmm. and then the, the LA Green, Larry Green's uh, update in 2001. What this translates into. Uh, uh, the, uh, the little red building uh, on the left. There are 113 encounters in that building for every encounter that happens in uh, our academic health center here at OHSU. And as I look at this, I'm thinking, you know, that the other issue is things are really complex. I mean, that's kind of a pretty complex structure uh, uh, that you're looking at with the academic health center. And, and so how can research that takes place in that setting really, uh, really have meaning uh, for those of us that, that practice uh, in these old square buildings, uh, uh, seeing patients uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis? And I'll jump in real quick for those who aren't familiar with Oregon. So the image on the right is OHSU, uh, a picture of OHSU or kind of tertiary hospital here. And the picture on the left is a small rural practice out in Scapoose, Oregon. And we want to take you, you probably can't see my arrow, but there's a tram that goes up down. We've got a campus on the waterfront where we're talking to you from today, but then you know, we'd have to ride the tram to get up to, up to the hill. And getting up the hill sometimes is a challenge uh, for research. <coughs> and so this is a different green. This is the LW green. And, uh, and this Lawrence Green uh, was the CC, CDC Director of uh, Prevention and Health Promotion. And, uh, and so he was one of our speakers. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lawrence said, if you want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. So we worked together at the practice level to begin to generate that evidence. And so what you're seeing here is uh, a group of folks around uh, uh, the tables uh, talking about what are, what are the research questions around childhood obesity. So this is uh, one of our complications that happen on an annual basis. And then, uh, then the other picture has our steering committee that uh, really, really keeps us grounded and, and staying connected uh, uh, to, to, their, to their practices. This is 10 years ago, and uh, that's, that's still uh, still uh, foundational for us. Uh, so we had an opportunity, Jack Westfall, Jim Mould, and I, to, to take a look at the NIH roadmap uh, back in 2006. Uh, and the, the NIH really wanted to begin to, uh, 
to move research out of just totally the academic health center into the communities and develop partnerships with organized patient communities, community-based health care for providers of care for large groups of patients that are interested in working with researchers to develop, test, and deliver new interventions. So this was, uh, was the NIH roadmap. Uh, had two main laboratories that the NIH uh, dealt with. So there's the bench research that those of us in an academic health centers are familiar with. That's actually kind of the center of the research uh, uh, universe of academic health centers. Uh, bedside uh, uh, was, was the other laboratory and began to ex extend that to uh, clinical practice. So bench to bedside, you're looking at phase one, phase two clinical trials. And there's translation that happens uh, to humans from, from basic, uh, basic science research. And then uh, as a result of those clinical trials, you say, okay, let's, let's try it out in practice. And so that's the other translation step uh, that was taking place. Uh, and with this, uh, with this paper, Blue Highways, uh, we wanted to, to describe the third translation step of really taking uh, uh, this research from, from practice more widely into day-to-day -day care of practices and it's where dissemination and implementation research takes place. At the T2 level, that translation step was often guideline development, uh, academic detailing took place, CME programs, and T3 is really testing things out in practice and that's, that's what we do in our networks. And uh, this Blue Highways came from a, uh, a book uh, uh, that uh, uh, we had read. Uh, and I just, it, it's really kind of a cool feeling to think about it. I really like getting out on the highway and, and it opens up my mind. And, and this quote from William Lee Keith Moon is, is, is really cool. On the Blue Highways uh, maps of America, the main routes were red and the back roads blue. Now even the colors are changing. But in those brevities just before dawn and a little after dusk, times neither day nor night, the old roads return to the sky some of its color. Then in truth, they carry a mysterious cast of blue and it's that time when the pole of the Blue Highway is strongest when the open road is beckoning strangeness, a place where a man can lose himself. And I think this is an opportunity where researchers can lose themselves and to kind of get, uh, get back to, uh, to a special place. And, uh, and other people have uh, recognized that the well, Let me jump okay. in real quick. I think the other thing we talk about, I, I'm trying to gauge from Liz if you've already seen the slide and how it explained, but there's also a T4, which I think the image uh, LJ just shared really emphasizes, which is practice is one component of a community, but there's also wide other contexts. So there's also a big push in practice mm -hmm. research practice-based implementation to community-based implementation. And I know that's your next session, so we won't touch on it too much here, but it'll definitely come up. So Thank you for, uh, for, uh, for that perspective, because we truly are, uh, uh, and we'll see that in a little bit, moving from practice to the, the broader community. And so this is uh, a uh, article that is online in Clinical Translation Science that just came out last week, uh, where yeah, I thought it was pretty neat that they were paying attention to the blue highways. And they, they were looking at bench to practice, talking about de uh, developing and enhancing community networks for research studies. And this really does go across the whole continuum. This is a continuum. We're even getting uh, patients and communities beginning to think about what are the implications of basic science research. Because if uh, a basic science researcher can't say, this is how this is going to changed health. Uh, maybe they shouldn't be doing the research. And uh, uh, so, you know, you, we're working together to explore how to fund uh, common areas of common interest. Uh, going down to looking at uh, the uh, translation step two, uh, many of us are having community advisory boards. Uh, we're developing uh, uh, memorandums of understanding how we can kind of share resources. Uh, how we work together 
and even jointly uh, uh, design the research questions that, that we're interested in. And very importantly, this is all about relationships. And so we are developing continuity relationships with the communities that we work with. So we foster trust. Uh, we understand that our, those are also what our limitations are, beginning to understand that, because sometimes they think that we're not important to practice. So this, uh, I thought this article was uh, was really worth uh, worth taking a look at. Maybe can I start one more time? Please. I think the other way to to take this home as you're thinking about designing your work is the idea of engaging often with your stakeholders and trying to figure out is your question relevant to those in the community. And as we continue to talk through the webinar, I think we'll really emphasize how the change in context of practice is really making it even more critical to make sure you're engaging in a way that is um, developing questions that, that are a really good match for the stakeholders you hope to serve. And so the, the other point to think about is we do a lot of effectiveness uh, research, and we know that things are efficacious in highly controlled environments, but how does it really work in practice? Are they ready? Are the practices ready for this new knowledge? Uh, can it be adapted to meet their, their context of care? So there's lots, lots of questions uh, uh, to, to think about in making our uh, research relevant to the real world. Uh, and here's one of my heroes, uh, uh, is Robbie Law, uh, who is a family physician. He's a, the last person I hired in Reedsport before I uh, abandoned that community and went to, uh, to the academic health center. And uh, then I left within a year after Robbie arrived. Uh, but he still hung in there with me. And he's been a, uh, a member of his practice, and he's been a member of our network. And, and this is what Robbie says. So those involved in a study that illustrate the value of doing research, grounded in clinical practice, the power of practice-based research to rigorously challenge conventional ivory tower wisdom and the ability of a network of practicing clinicians to make an important contribution to the practice of medicine. That's a, I think, you know, he really does feel that. I mean, uh, he uh, was uh, uh, a, uh, one of the six initial physicians that helped start the network in 2003, and Rodney's still, uh, still, still with us. Uh, hello? Hello? Today. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, I just want to remind everyone to yeah. keep their phones on mute. Please. We did get a little feedback. Um, and also, if you if you could just speak a little louder into the towards the phone, um, I did get some concerns in regards to um, audio. Great, great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the... Uh, the mic closer to me, and I hope that's better. So, Vladimir, let me know if that's if, if that's uh, uh, getting to where it needs to get in terms of uh, of uh, uh, in, uh, loudness. So, I, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, we've been doing this work now for a number of decades, and the people in the landscape has changed. And I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and so I want to, because uh, I'm old. Uh, so this is new rhetoric. LJ doesn't usually say. That. Okay, but anyway, uh, because a lot of these people, and then, you know, Jim can relate to this, and some of you out there can can relate to us. Has primarily been uh, a family physician uh, uh, led organization. We're fortunate to have other. Other disciplines, nurses, uh, pediatricians are uh, a very significant part of what we do in uh, practice-based uh, research these days. And our network members are people that really uh, wanted to be involved in, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing things out there. And I also want to stay connected. So face-to-face -face convocations were, were important when I was one of the Aspen members, I look forward to going to Colorado Springs and seeing Larry Green and Jim Werner and Paul Nutting and, uh, and getting together with other folks. One of the uh, foundational things for us in practice is we didn't have a lot of tech then and we kept things fairly simple. Uh, 
And the other thing that I think was a source of pride for us is we were considered a fringe movement in the research community. And I, I'm hoping that that's still somewhat the case today, because I like being on the fringe. Uh, and so this is practice number 29. Uh, so we wore clothes that were a little different. Uh, we, had, uh, we had hair. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, okay. And then the and the uh, picture uh, the figure on the right where it's just four uh, four men. Bob Graham is with his thumb down. Uh, that's who the Graham Center for Health Policy and, and Research in Washington D.C. is named after. And uh, in spite of his thumb down, they did fund me uh, to be a part of the uh, of the rural practice uh, uh, project. Uh, and this is uh, this is our data collection tool. It's a card study. And we studied a lot of clinical questions. On this one, there were two questions that we were studying at the time, uh, looking at uh, uh, patients, uh, women presenting with uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, and also women that uh, were having a miscarriage. At the time we did this uh, study, the dictum in Williams' textbook of obstetrics was that every woman that was having a miscarriage in the first trimester uh, should have a DNC. And we know we didn't do that, and so uh, we wanted to document uh, what we were doing and what the outcomes of that were. And, uh, and so we published a lot of this work. This is uh, from April 1994, uh, and you can see on here that there are a number of common conditions, carpal tunnel syndrome, how does uh, chest pain present in primary care, undifferentiated chest pain, what's diabetes care look like, asthma. Uh, we also published that paper on uh, the fact that women that were miscarrying uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy, most of them didn't get DNCs and they did fine. And the next uh, edition of Williams' textbook of obstetrics got rid of that, that recommendation. And in this particular issue, Linda Niebauer, who's kind of one of the uh, uh, den mothers of PBRNs uh, in the United States, who I really value my relationship with Linda, interviewed folks about uh, a variety of questions. Why, why were we doing this? And, uh, and so we, we talked about it in that one. So here's what things look like these days. It's really hard. Uh, I'm sure we thought it was really hard back then, but it's like really hard now. Uh, patients are much more complex. Uh, it's uh, patient, uh, number of patient visits uh, in a day is gone down. I mean, I used to see 30 patients a day. I'd be pretty exhausted uh, seeing 15 to 20 patients a day these days. Patients are a lot more complex. The visits are no longer just 15 minutes. They're longer. Uh, we're seeing fewer physician-owned practices. There are a lot of different motherships, and so there are many more layers that we have to go through as a practice-based research network to think about. Uh, and people are really busy. Uh, and, and they're trying to cover a lot of bases. Uh, primary care physicians, uh, shortage, there's a shortage and the distribution is not always what it needs to be. But one of the really cool things, I think, has been the increasing role for non-physician clinicians. Nurse practitioners and physician assistants are incredibly important to the work we do. They're not mid-level providers, they're non-physician clinicians. And I want you to get rid of the term mid-level providers and uh, respectfully call them non-physician clinicians. Uh, they're valuable partners in what, we, in what happens in practice. And the other thing is technology. Uh, technology at all aspects uh, uh, of care. Uh, and that includes uh, with the clinician and with patients. And, uh, wow, these, this is really true. I mean, I think paper records, uh, it's hard to find practices with uh, paper records. We still do. Uh, we still find some, and uh, they still do some really great work. Uh, but the electronic health record uh, has made its way into all our practices. It probably hasn't made life easier uh, for folks. And that's a, a, a subject of much discussion and actually research opportunities. The, the other thing is the rise of integrated delivery systems. I mentioned the different motherships. And so we have to integrate 
uh, our work uh, into uh, the mission of some of these other organizations, and at least be aware of them and develop relationships beyond the practice to where we become a valued partner of these other organizations. That's been a critical thing uh, for us to do. And it actually can be useful because they have resources sometimes that they can uh, get into things. So I'm still okay? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Okay. So uh, this is talking about how busy life is. So where are we going to get 18 hours a day? Where are our physicians going to get 18 hours a day? And where are they going to get time to think about the research that we may want to do in their practices on top of that? So we just have to be aware of that. And so part of what we do as practice-based research network is to see how we can change this, this paradigm. And there are um, many opportunities to study healthcare delivery and to see how we can change this so uh, we can make uh, a livable day for the, for the clinicians and their practices. Right. I'll, I'll jump back in. So um, the reason I think we wanted to review some of the context of how practice is changing is because it's really relevant, I think, to how you think about designing your studies uh, for practice-based research networks. So one of the things, I, I started with Orphan back in 2007 as a facilitator, and it was really interesting at that time because we were working with um, rural practices across the state, and when you would go out to engage with those clinics, they really saw you as a resource. They saw you as, as someone who connected them to cutting-edge research knowledge, to opportunities at the main academic institute, and, and you were really the only game in town who had some quality improvement skills. And that, I think, is where we'll hear from the panel, has changed quite a bit in terms of um, the support that's now provided to various clinics through their kind of mothership hospital organizations, um, through the various initiatives that are out there in terms of practice redesign, be it for patient-centered medical home or behavioral health integration or uh, achieving various quality metrics. And so um, not only potentially have, have patients got a little bit more complex and the structure of practices got a little bit more complex, but there are now many stakeholders who are interested in engaging uh, clinicians, clinics, and health systems as well as communities and research. So in terms of the research landscape, we see some parallel changes in how studies are conducted. So instead of um, CAR studies or even when I started, we, we used to consider um, low kind of light studies and complex studies. And those light studies were chart audits. And they were really an opportunity to go into the practice to build initial rapport and relationships and to have the research team doing the work. Um, with the rise of electronic health records, you, you don't really see many chart, chart audit studies anymore. You see analysis using big data. And what I wanted to ask is to have the, the fellows on the phone, if you are actually thinking about doing some type of study <coughs> using big data so that analyzes data across either multiple practices or using the same electronic health record system, raise your hand if that's something you're thinking of. <laughs> We see Liz raising her hand. Okay, Matt Simpson. So a few people, three of the fellows, okay. Oh, four, five, because we have Liz here. Okay, so a lot of you are thinking about big data and how to uh, answer some of your questions using those materials. What about the idea of multi-component intervention? So one of the, the parallels that we often see in practice is it's not necessarily a single intervention that's being tried, such as creating a new um, cue in the electronic health record. It might be something complex in terms of changing the health record system, changing practice workflows, and even adding a new member to the clinical staff. So how many of you are thinking of doing something that uses a multi-component intervention? So Liz? And maybe for, for, for Matt or Alex, who are, who, those people who have your hand up, would you either type in the chat box or unmute your phone and just share a little bit? What are, what are you thinking of doing? Um, this is Alex. Uh, I'm just reflecting on a conversation yesterday at a practice um, medical director meeting for our primary care network that's the largest member of our PBRN. 
here at Duke, and um, the issue of access came up. And so, you know, how could a PBRN help, um, in this case, Duke Primary Care, investigate different approaches to increasing access? Great. Good. We'll look forward. We might call on you and the panel to explore that more with you, Alex. Thanks for jumping in. Um, what about any others? Tamer or Matthew, what, what are you thinking about? How, how are you approaching this? Hi, this is Matt. And um, I was thinking about doing was using registry data from primary care practices as a platform for community engagement intervention. Great. That sounds really, really interesting. And so basically, um, would you be looking at certain clinical indicators, or what are you thinking there? Yeah, I'm still early in my thinking, as you can probably tell, but um, probably starting with one sort of chronic condition, several mm -hmm. clinics in the urban area here, and seeing, you know, what we can do to engage the clinics and community outreach and things like that. Very interesting. Well, we might call on you as well. So we really, um, I think, raising your hands, what you guys indicated is you guys are really thinking about how to capitalize on the changing research. And I think, Matthew, what you're flagging in your proposal is how do you kind of match what the practice is doing to, to what the community, and Alex as well, your idea of how do we improve access. So really meeting practices where they are to figure out what are the real, like, pressing issues that, that clinicians and staff are facing in every day, and how can we bring research to bear on that. Um, some other ways the research landscape is changing is just in terms of terminology. So really a growing body of, of expertise and language around what are we doing when we're doing dissemination and implementation research. Um, also, how are we approaching this idea of patient-centered outcomes research or making sure we're assessing outcomes that matter to patients or other stakeholders. And then again, just emphasizing how, you know, Research is not the only game in town for these practices, and there are multiple, actually, entities who are interested in, in helping practices meet, meet the needs and demand. So I think it's really important to think about how do the research strategies you're proposing map onto or complement the other, the other factors that clinics are working through. So really quickly, this is a great article that, that highlights the way PBRNs have, have tried to really help bridge quality improvement in research in terms of both making sure that the work they're doing is rigorous, but also that it has the tendency of being applicable, or meeting the ends of need users, um, trying to make sure it's complementing, not totally disrupting usual practice, and that, um, you know, Action happens quickly so that, so that clinics are learning from the data that's being, being obtained, not just at the end of the project. The other thing to highlight, I think, a benefit of PBRNs when you're thinking about doing this work is they really um, provide access to some of the populations that, that tend to be excluded from traditional clinical trials. And part of, I think, what LJ was describing earlier is the fact that PBRNs have built rapport, built relationships with these clinics makes it much easier to engage um, and to uh, interact with these populations when, when there is a need uh, to, to work with these kind of non-traditional suspects. The other thing really quickly to emphasize, and, and you guys already shared this even, Matt, with your example, is that there's a really increasing movement to go beyond the clinic walls. So, you guys might have um, seen this material before from McGinnis, but looking at the, the factors that really contribute to premature death, and we can see that healthcare is accounts for about a 10 percent, you know, piece of this pie. But really, social circumstances, environmental exposure, behavioral patterns, so some of these social determinants of health account for almost more than 60 percent. So there's really an important need to. Um, not just be working with individuals in a clinic setting, but, but be approaching things using a socioecological model or, or um, multi-level model where we're looking at individuals housed within a social structure, within an organization, within a context. So really um, acknowledging the complexity of, of some of what, you know, leads individuals to um, monitor their hemoglobin A1C on a regular basis as, as we're hoping. 
Um, so this is, Jim, this was something I think you really wanted us to emphasize, and it's something that I think is becoming even more important given this change in context. But um, when developing either research questions for a practice setting or for a community setting, there's been a traditional model. Sorry, I'm seeing Anne's, Anne's uh, comment there. Maybe we can revisit that. But um, models of practice-based research and thinking about is the question coming primarily from the researcher or the funder? Are you generating questions from the clinic, clinician or the patient using maybe a community-based participatory research method? Or are you actually doing something that is perhaps the most common where you're actually trying to blend, where you're using kind of the clinical research expertise to map onto the clinician or staff or patient concerns and trying to think where is really that sweet spot where we can leverage kind of community needs with um, research expertise. Where, where is that? And I think, Anne, what you were saying is that in this figure, it's not that this is divided. There's actually interaction between all these levels. I think that's what your, your comment was referencing. So turning it back to LJ to start talking about, so what, what do we do with this? How do we actually try and motivate our stakeholders to engage with us in research? So, so given, uh, given that, I'd like to, uh, you know, we're, we've paced the, uh, this session so that there's time for a bit of a conversation uh, here, and I'd like to open it up. Uh, this is Amanda. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, but Alex yeah, had a follow-up. Alex Cho had a follow-up um, to what Melinda said earlier in the comment section. Um, so, what do yeah. we do when primary care's questions, especially in the IDS context, are less about clinical practice than they are operations? And are the funders embracing this shift? So, Alex, would you mind just getting back on and sharing a little bit more about the context for your question? Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, I guess, like, you know, again, in uh, attending the, um, the practice medical director meetings and participating in this um, Duke Primary Care-wide collaborative that we have, the focus of the improvements um, is really about producti things like productivity, I mentioned access, and then other things like work-life balance. Um, and, you know, these are clearly important questions, um, you know, clearly valuable to, you know, patients, the providers, clinic staffs, outcomes. But not being new to this and, and just not knowing, you know, are these fundable questions, I guess, <laughs> is my question. I, I think you're raising a really important point, which is basically, um, maybe where do you look and what are the different sources for some of these funding? So in terms of access, work-life balance. Um, I don't know, LJ. I, th I think that's an incredibly important question, but I also kind of want to know, what, what does IDS stand for, Alex? Oh, Integrated Delivery Systems. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah, so really things have gotten a lot more complex uh, out there, and there's, uh, there's a lot of give and take, and so we have to begin to, to sometimes adapt kind of our research design uh, to uh, meet the context uh, of the settings uh, where we want to do this, uh, this work, and so there is some give and take uh, on that, and so we probably do some unfunded uh, activities uh, in return for saying, you know, why don't we kind of address this research question and we'd really like to do it this way. And, and so sometimes there's some trade-offs there. Mm -hmm. I, I'd kind of like to hear from other folks if they've had experiences with that. Liz, please. Go ahead, give her the mic. Sorry. This is Liz Waddell and my role at Orphan is a senior study director, so I get the opportunity to work on a lot of different projects. Um, and often the work that I'm doing is trying to integrate the, the academic research and federally funded larger trials um, and get them into our orphan clinics. And one example of 
this tension between research and the operational needs of the practices has come forth with our participation in NIDA's Northwest Node of the Clinical Trials Network. And so Orphan joined um, the Northwest Node to bring our network practices an opportunity to participate in national clinical trials focused on substance use disorders and treatment for substance use disorders in primary care. And we are really big time running into trouble recruiting clinics. Um, the node has experience now with clinics coming to them and really competing to participate in trials. And so we're having to tell the node, well, we need to adjust because primary care practices are actually really resistant to participating in anything that disrupts their workflow. And they need to be convinced that any research study is going to have direct value to the practice and its patients. So when we bring um, a scientifically sound research protocol that involves um, surveys and follow-up and, you know, 45 minutes potentially of extended interaction with a patient, um, the clinic is really going to balk at that initially. So as we start to bring, I think, the, you know, I'll say capital R or academic funded research into our practices, as the practices are increasingly overburdened um, with lots of other administrative tasks um, from payers, from state health departments, from other funders, I think there needs to be a, an incredible shift in the research designs themselves. And the need for flexibility, I mean, it's, it's there now. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from others if they have experienced um, similar issues as they try to recruit practices into more traditional trials. Comments about that? Because this day is really hard. I'd like to hear from some folks on the phone about this. Hello? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm uh, Tamer Said. I'm really, uh, I'm really surprised with the with the last comment regarding the, the difficulty. I think it is usually much more difficult to engage people in primary care compared to other more specialties, which tend to have more focus on research. And I was not really sure why. I think I think part of it is funding, but I'm really surprised to see that even uh, practices that seem to have the academic fund having difficulty recruiting clinics to be part, uh, despite so the fact me, that the fund... Let me clarify. Okay. So Orprin is part of, um, you know, we're a practice-based research ne network located at the university, but the practices within our network are typically unaffiliated. Their private primary care practices mm. without any academic affiliation. But does, is the research itself is funded or not funded? I mean, are they getting a, com a compensation for the time that they are dedicating to the research the or research, not? Sure. So the research, the researchers have federal funding to do research. Some of that trickles down to participating sites, mm -hmm. uh, but the sites do not typically get a lot of funding. Maybe they would get, you know, thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So, so that's a really important question. So we we wanted to kind of uh, share resources with a particular study. So we said, why don't we? We had a, this was on a medication reconciliation study and. We were uh, wanting to have a very IT savvy uh, internal medicine doctor who cared a lot about research but in full time practice be one of the co investigators. So we covered 0.5 of Carl's FTE with the grant. Well, the problem was with that is the practice didn't take care of that 0.5 FTE. He still had a 1.0 FTE responsibility. Uh, with with the practice, he had a medical assistant that he had to keep busy. Uh, he had call duties, and uh, and so it's not all about resources. It's understanding how the structure of practice takes place, and sometimes it can be a real challenge. We may have really good motivation, and we may have a great funded study, but it's still not possible to do it uh, because there aren't. Uh, these uh, these resources within the practice to, to make it happen. And I actually, I even wanted to jump in and get back to what I think was Alex's original question, which is, 
what, what do we do when what seems to be coming down from the funding agencies might not exactly overlap with what the clinicians in practice or the, the community partners, stakeholders are telling us they want to study? Um, and I, I could say, I guess, um, maybe I'll offer a little bit about my personal experience and then I'd be interested in what some of the other mentors might have to say. But one of the things that's been really interesting is we've been working to build kind of an academic community research coalition in the Columbia Gorge. And that's a rural area that's about an hour east of, um, of, of Portland. And we've done a number of, the community has already done a community health needs assessment for their work with the coordinated care organizations that are being implemented in Oregon. So they have a pretty clear list of the things they're interested in, ranging from uh, mental health integration, improving access and transitions between, you know, foster care, improving housing, increasing nutrition, um, enhancing dental integration in primary care, and improving kind of, um, I guess, achievement of some of the clinical quality metrics, in particular around colorectal cancer screening, diabetes screening, and, and depression. Um, but what's been really interesting is as we've engaged with these partners, I think I've, I've tried to be really um, transparent in terms of the tensions, um, in terms of recognizing that there are kind of um, priorities from the funding agencies and interests from the community. And, and what we've been able to do is through building a partnership and, and creating a dialogue both around what are the local needs and interests and what are some of the opportunities from the funders, I think, I think we're able to try and figure out where are the places we align and how can we use those places that, that there is alignment to potentially leverage for other opportunities that maybe aren't so easy. So for example, in the Gorge, I think there's, there's greater ease in figuring out how do we get funding to implement evidence-based interventions for colorectal cancer screening than necessarily there are for improving housing to, to the low income population although that's really one of the, the key priorities of the community. And so really trying to think about how do we um, get some funding to maybe move a metric that is more supported by national funders um, with the ultimate goal that that creates a foundation for addressing some of these other areas of interest. I guess the other thing that comes to mind is, is um, I think the questions you're raising are critical, and maybe there are some smaller buckets of money um, that could be used to address them. I think the tension is, as a junior faculty, trying to think about where do you prioritize your time. And I would really, I think, encourage you to talk with your mentor about that in terms of, you know, how do you balance potentially the, the pressure for getting a larger grant that might move you more forward in an academic professional trajectory with this desire to meet local practice needs and hoping that by fostering some of those really, I guess, pressing, exciting questions, you're also able in time as you develop your skills to leverage that into funding. So I, I don't think I have a, an answer, but I would just emphasize and identify with you that I think these are really important questions. Um, the other thing I've noticed, sorry, is. I heard somebody well, I wants to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was me again. I was, I think one of one of the the major issues that I have going through, you know, going through residency, fellowship, and ending up being a, a, a junior faculty too, is that, you know, there is we are in primary care. I think we are the least emphasizing on research during training. So I think research is is not a big is not a it doesn't show up during even the residency training. I mean, there is always an included part of research that is mandatory mandatory for everybody to graduate. But I think the emphasis is not there. And you don't find a lot of uh, mentors, research mentors, during your training. And I think this is one of the issues that, that does not clarify the vision for residents early in, in or early when they're starting to see primary care to understand that Research is really important, and it really can transform practices early in the training. Uh, I'm sorry, it transforms practices later when they grow, and they can continue with that. And I think mostly we, when we are trying to enhance the ag academic potential 
in in the trainees, I think this is usually is really very helpful later on to get more engaged. When you talk about more like like we were talking about private practice and stuff, I think that since the academic potential is not there, I think research tends to get a little bit more um, neglected, I would say, and the interest becomes a little bit uh, less. That's that's what that, that's my impression. That I I, uh, I I I can figure out that this is one of the main issues that we can uh, try to tackle to improve the interest later on when somebody graduates. Uh, boy, what a, what a great comment. I, I think that that's really right on target. I think we haven't really uh, uh, done much of that in, in our, our training programs. And I'd like to take, you know, we've got this big question up there, and I think I like where the conversation's going, and I'm wondering, Melinda, if we can't just kind of be a little flexible about uh, kind of moving uh, to more of an interactive uh, component and get, uh, and, and get the panel. But I'd like to to hear uh, from some folks that have been making comments. Uh, Rachel, you want to expand on, on, on your uh, 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 comments here? Sure. Can you hear me all right? I, we hear you great. Great. So, yeah, I had made the comment in my former position, I sort of became the director of research by default and worked with residents directly designing research projects, some of which were inpatient, but many of which were in our outpatient family medicine center. And, um, you know, the ACGME and the AOA do require family medicine residents to complete two scholarly projects, one of which must be a quality project. And what I experienced was that there's a, a broad range of differential in different programs in terms of the rigor of what happens. Many programs do things to sort of check the box in terms of getting that requirement done um, using different resources where people can work in giant groups or do sort of very limited stuff that isn't really under the category of true research or even true quality projects. There are a lot of people, though, who do do these and do them well, and we see residents presenting at STSM and all kinds of other things. The problem that I think most of us who are trying to do these things realize is that most of our faculty do not have a background in public health or research or biostatistics or things in order to have the ability to lead these projects and guide residents who oftentimes themselves don't have a lot of research experience coming into family medicine. So there's sort of a feedback down the back line in terms of you know, family medicine is an academic pursuit, and we are interested in, in prospective residents who have an interest in research, um, and, and that can build. So, so that is there, but it's very different in different programs depending on their resources, their faculty, how well they're able to support faculty. Those who are in community programs really struggle with that, and unless they have partnerships with, with university settings, for example, or larger collaboratives. They struggle, but there are many who do and do do it well. Uh, Rachel, that's that's great. We, I, we've got some other folks that we want to hear from. Uh, uh, Tamara, do you want to comment? Well, I, I think I mean uh, th this is great. I think um, in um, in 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 my not a great experience, but I think that uh, usually during residency. Since primary care is quite a very tight residency and time is pretty limited, um, my experience is usually that um, we ha I have been involved with many residents in research too, but I think the the time constraints play a major role and it kind of interferes with their uh, time to to produce good good research. And I think the idea is not to be able to do just the quality improvement research during residency, but the idea is to look into further how can they improve it and look for funding later on and try to enlarge their uh, prospective research rather than I think quality improvement is great, especially in a clinical setting, but I think to progress further and look at further funding and try to approach um, you know higher yield research, I think still is an issue. Um, but I, I don't see, we don't see a lot of, of, uh, of publications coming out based on quality improvement coming from residents during training. 
um, as compared to other specialties that I've seen with cardiology, for instance, with gastroenterology, which uh, seem that the yield is uh, a little bit higher than ours. Th thanks, Tamara. I, 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 and you uh, have written in a comment. I'd like to uh, take your perspective. Yes, can you hear me? Can you? Oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, I I sort of wonder how we're preparing learners going through med school and residency to become um, physicians who are willing to be engaged in practice-based research in their community practices. And I just don't know if we have a lot of opportunities for learners to um, to sort of see physicians who are perhaps a member of a practice-based research network. And I was wondering about um, if people had ideas of, of how we can cultivate that experience for people in their training, not necessarily so they become um, researchers, for example, who are going through a fellowship like this, but so that they can become um, clinician, community-based members of, of practice-based research, which um, I think we need to consciously cultivate that, that group as well as our cohort. So Anne, I think cultivation is incredibly important. You know, I, I, I'd like to hear from you, Matt, uh, or from Jim, uh, about your thoughts about what Anne's talking about, uh, cultivating that and what the opportunities are in terms of the fellowship. Here to, uh, to to think about maybe a role for cultivating uh, other folks. Well, and maybe just before Jim, before you jump on, the thing I did want to point out is the article by Linda Niebauer and Paul Nutting from back in 1994. It's really interesting because I think Anne, what you're proposing were some of the things that those um, practicing clinicians said in that article was was you know, the opportunity to be connected to a practice-based research network meant that I was willing to go practice in a, you know, small, isolated rural practice. I didn't have to give up my academic aspirations with my desire to, you know, be a community-based clinician. So I think one of the things that, that strikes me is it's interesting that, what is that, well over 20 years ago, some of the motivating factors perhaps for people to engage with PBRNs might be similar motivating factors that occur today despite all these complex changes in the system. So Jim, I don't, I don't know if you have more insight, but. Well, um, I think it's a great discussion and really very important <clears throat> because uh, we, we really do need a pipeline of uh, young clinicians coming out of residency who want to do research in primary care. Um, and it is, it is challenging to do, and I, I think, I think uh, what, what, what probably is highly influential is seeing that modeled by, um, by people in, uh, by the preceptors in residency training and elsewhere. And I think in the subspecialties they see a lot of that um, in oncology and clinical trials are going on and, you know, a lot of oncology practices that's just part of practice. And when we've approached um, some of the subspecialties about um, developing PBRNs, um, one of the responses we got was, well, we're already engaged in a lot of clinical trials research. We're already doing a lot of things. Sort of our, our uh, available time for research is actually already, uh, we're already engaged in research. But we don't really have that in primary care. One of the things that we did and we've done in Cleveland, over a period of about eight years, we trained about 30 of our uh, clinicians in practice in uh, research fellowships. This, these were funded by three different HRSA grants, and we protected uh, about 10 percent of their time, four hours a week, um, to, to de develop research skills and implement research projects to try to get people out into the community who are doing that and can model that when they are precepting med students or uh, of their residency attendings uh, so that others can see that. And so what we're, now that HRSA funding is not as available, what we do now is take some of our shared resource funding and we've created a micro-grant program. So we have these $2,500 uh, small, tiny grants that are mentored projects. So we work with clinicians um, and either 
Kurt or myself will mentor them in developing and pursuing a research project or a small group of them, or even better yet, we'll match them with an investigator who's doing similar kinds of work or is interested in doing similar kinds of work. And together they can uh, develop research skills in the, the, the clinician and then the academic can perhaps generate some preliminary studies data. Um, and almost always these, these small studies are publishable. So these are just small things that we're able to do now, but we usually have three or four going on at any given time. So it's helpful, but it is, um, it's, it's a culture challenge, I think, you know, as I was talking about earlier. Um, the culture is a little different and, and um, it's a culture shift perhaps, but it's also now um, become um, practical matters are really affecting the, the available time for clinicians. So. You know, it's not an easy, there's no a easy answer to this, but I think, um, I think, uh, you know, working within residencies and training attendings uh, is, is really an important uh, direction to think about. So thanks, Jim. We, we're going to continue this discussion, uh, and uh, there's a, a comment or two in the chat box that we want to uh, follow up. Uh, I also want to just kind of add the fact that one of the things with this fellowship that uh, we think is important is the role of non-clinicians uh, researchers in understanding uh, and studying uh, primary care. And so we're, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a bit as well. But what I wanted to do was to take kind of uh, following up on Jim's comment, talking about how they've done things that cases to look at, at our network and what we've done to try to relate to folks that live in these communities. You should be seeing the map of Oregon. Uh, and the mission uh, that the steering committee came up with was to improve the health of rural Oregonians by promoting knowledge transfer between communities and, and clinicians. And so what we've done uh, uh, to uh, to do that, you can see the maps got different colors. Is uh, this is a steering committee, and these are people that we meet with each month and, and uh, talk on the phone. Uh, but uh, this is what I want to talk about: are the relationship building uh, that exists uh, between practices and the network. How do we stay? How do we stay connected to the world of practices? And communities when we're in, a, in, a, in an academic health center, and uh, and so uh, at the start of this, we mentioned I think it was uh, Zolt who talked about uh, practice facilitators and, and the practice enhancement assistants that were in Oklahoma. Many of us have uh, gone to that model. We have practice enhancement research coordinators. Uh, that this name it was arrived at in 2004 when we started this model. And we said we want these folks to be practice enhancement folks as well as research coordinators because that's how we got funded was with research studies. And so I would really kind of like to turn things over to Melinda and to have her work with uh, our practice enhancement research coordinators to hear what things look like from their on the ground uh, experience. And, and I was um, actually, Brian, I see your post there about this tension between building relationships with, with local stakeholders versus burdening them. And what I was hoping to do is to really talk about how Orcrin has designed our infrastructure to try and facilitate that process. And I think this is something that's really important for practice-based research as well as community-engaged research, is really thinking about how we structure and resource kind of a foundation to make it so um, appropriate matches and conversations can happen in a way that are really beneficial both for the investigator and for the individual working in the field. And I know that um, when I was a facilitator, one of, one of the roles you really played was trying to understand what is the local context for a community, for a practice, what are the local interests. And then as research opportunities came from our partners at OHSU to try and think, um, how do we leverage, how do we create, in some ways it brings up the term of collective impact, but how do we leverage 
mutual interest to move a project forward. And what I wanted to do is perhaps to welcome Beth or Emily to talk a little bit about how you thought about um, almost being a broker for, for opportunities with the practice. And I guess the other level that maybe we can address later is I think within the PBRN, there are often intermediates such as Liz's role on some of the projects or my role that also plays a, a role in um, educating interested academic stakeholders about what the priorities are of the practice, building on what we've heard from the PERC. So Beth and, and Emily, it's, it's a little bit of a, a broader question, I think, than initially, but how have you played a role in facilitating the match between or, or figuring out who to connect if there is an academic who might have a, an interest that really fits with a, a clinical partner? Thanks, Melinda. This is Beth. Uh, well, one thing that we, I don't think, mentioned earlier is that we, um, many of our facilitators, well, we're located across the state. Many of us um, are regionally based, as it were, so we are really embedded in the communities that we serve. One of the great benefits of that is that we have, this, you know, our fingers on the floor of current needs or wants from the practices in those communities. And as Melinda mentioned, we really kind of act as a communicator, um, relaying those needs and wants back to investigators, which can help them discern opportunities for potential studies, um, as well as uh, ensure that they have um, consideration around barriers that they may face or we may face um, in recruiting stakeholders. So one of the wonderful things that, um, I like the arrows, uh, sorry. Uh, one of the wonderful things that um, Orburn has really done in terms of um, the primary investigators that we work with, both internally and externally, um, has really been leveraging um, as much as is feasible, both the facilitator or perk on the ground to make connections um, because of our established relationships, and then also really listening to the perks um, to really uh, understand what strategic conversations might need to occur um, at a PI level, for example. So, um, you know, one of the other great benefits, I would say, too, about having regionally based um, facilitators is, is that ability to have face-to-face -face conversations, um, both in recruitment and then, of course, in continuous engagement throughout the life of a study or a project. Um, we have found um, that face-to-face, -face, in person, is uh, probably the most effective method of gaining uh, stakeholder <coughs> engagement, both at the recruitment at initial outset and then continuously throughout the life of a project. So I would say that we, one of the major pieces that we do is, is really to um, both continuously message around the mission or vision or goals of a project um, to help folks who are participating be able to connect back the daily activities or the work that they are doing around the project, um, which is very easy. We've all experienced this. Um, both in our personal lives and in our work atmosphere, is that you know you can really lose sight of, of the reason, the perspective, the point of the work that you are doing, and that really does affect your motive, affect excuse me, uh, your level of motivation. And so that's part of what we do is to help them connect back to um, the purpose or the goals of the study, and then to really, as much as feasible, align with with what their current needs are. So that's kind of our, our that's our goal. Basically. I wonder so, if one of the, sorry, who is, who is that? This is me on Tim's side again. I was, uh, I think this was a great uh, explanation of the of the use of face-to-face -face and uh, coordination. But I was w wondering, what is the mechanism by which practices reach to you, or do you start your studies and then go on and try to reach out for practices, asking them to be part of your studies, or there is another mechanism by which practices find out what they want to look into and then there is a certain mechanism by which they can reach you and ask if this is a feasible study. That is such an excellent question, and I would say all of the above. One of the great benefits um, is that, you know, we, Orban has been around for quite some time, and LJ is very, very well known across the state. So he's been working on his networking for quite some time. 
So there's a, there's a base that we have. But um, I'm hoping Emily can actually speak to some of this uh, as it relates to our approaches to uh, reaching out to practices that we have not worked with historically in our new Healthy Hearts Northwest project. Um, and, and there are many different approaches. Um, but media is one method that we really um, have also been looking into and doing a lot more about. We've got a really great e-news and electronic newsletter that comes out monthly, monthly, excuse me, um, and, and a lot of different mechanisms for practices to connect with us proactively as well as, of course, us doing that outreach as well. So Emily, I want to turn that over to you. Sure. Can we to briefly describe the project first? Sure. So um, like Beth said, we are working on our Healthy Hearts Northwest project right now, which is a 36-month long project funded by the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. And basically, um, it is tailoring kind of a perk position into helping practices move the needle on their overall cardiovascular health of their patients. Um, so that um, entails 15 months of practice facilitator or PERC support, as well as health information technology support. And um, the project is aligned with the Million Hearts campaign. So we're working directly with the ABCS measures, which are um, aspirin when appropriate, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. And as we are working with those metrics, we are also um, kind of coaching them towards a sustainable infrastructure for quality improvements that doesn't just go away when uh, the practice facilitator leaves. Um, and we're also helping them leverage their Q or excuse me, their um, EHR and their HIT to use data to identify care gaps in their patient panels and again um, have a sustainable method for quality improvement. So um, that's explained how Orprin has a great base of practices that we work with, but um, we've been or I've had a lot of experience working with cold calling <laughs> practices. So um, it has proven to be really difficult and kind of the, the broad overarching uh, message we've kind of come up with is that it takes a lot of touches to get through um, to practices and get to the right person. Um, it does start with a cold call. It, it could start with a cold fax of material and literature, um, a cold email. Um, but after that, it's asking for often the clinic or practice manager um, if they're available to hear kind of uh, literally a two-minute pitch. Um, sometimes I can hear them you know, doing other things while they are <laughs> listening to me on the phone. So it really is about um, drilling down to a really key message. You are selling the project. So it, it really is kind of salesmanship. Um, if they're willing to hear you out and give you a fax number and email, that's, you know, that's your second touch. And then sometimes, um, a method that we've been using is talking to the scheduler. So if we can't get through to a provider, if we can't get through to the, the clinic manager, we're asking, you know, is there any way we can come in over the lunch hour for a 30-minute quick meeting? Um, and those have proven to, to be our most successful approach. When we get our foot in the door, when we get that face-to-face -face interaction, that's really when we kind of seal the deal on the project. So I, I want to just echo a few of the things that Emily um, highlighted and just to um, illustrate, I think, the benefit of potentially working with an existing PBRN or an existing community-engaged research coalition. And then I know we have um, about 10 minutes left, and so I was thinking maybe we could um, potentially tackle the question that, um, yeah, uh, um, the question that, I think it was Brian you'd raised about your own study. I thought maybe we could puzzle through that with you as, a, as an exercise. But I think um, the question is how do you identify research questions and how do you either engage clinics um, in a study that's already been funded or how do you move a clinic's idea toward a funded study? And I think what Emily was describing is this idea of how do you, the perks do a really amazing job of knowing the local context, the local lay of the land, the competing priorities on this practice, and making kind of the, almost the business case for why a clinic would want to engage in the study. I think that the, you know, other side of that coin is this question of how do we help 
practicing clinicians or other stakeholders move their potential interest into research questions. And actually, Andrew, if you scroll down in the chat, Andrew describes in, in their health system how they have different models for their clinicians. And one of those models is to have some protected time for practicing clinicians to think about that. Um, you can also look in the community engagement literature. I mean, there's a, a big move now, at least in community engagement work, to think about how, how do we build these partnerships? How do we foster kind of questions from the ground up? And I think Orprin has tried to do that for a number of years by having an annual convocation. We have monthly meetings with our steering committee where those clinician members really vet and give input on potential research studies. But we also have an annual convocation, and that's a real opportunity for members to come together to talk about areas that are of interest to them and to try and flesh out, you know, are there potential opportunities here. Um, LJ, you, you put up a new slide that talks about developing the value proposition. And I'm wondering, Brian, if you want to, would you be willing to share a little bit more about your study and, and perhaps the team on the phone could kind of strategize about how you might engage the right stakeholders in that approach? Can you hear me? I, I can't see Brian. Okay, I can't thank you. Yeah, um, so my you. idea is still very uh, much in its infancy, but I'm a pediatrician. Um, and this will actually be my first project. Um, but what I'm trying to, to do is um, work on gun violence prevention. Um, and one thing we do within our own practice is we're able to provide uh, gun locks as we're giving, um, as we're discussing uh, gun, uh, gun safety. Um, and I'm just trying to get a sense of from other practices. Um, I'm in an academic practice at Duke. Um, but there's plenty of private practices nearby about what other groups are doing and the attitudes of the physicians in surrounding this issue, because um, obviously it's a political issue, unfortunately, for many. Um, and also um, the patients. Um, there's, as in many states, there's been some attempts at legislation to restrict physician communication with patients surrounding um, guns. Um, so what I'm really going to be trying to do is get a sense of what physician and family attitudes are kind of in parallel and see if there's a disconnect, like the old disconnect between um, physicians and patients in terms of how they looked at the use of electronic medical records. Um, physicians all thought that patients hated them for doing it. In fact, patients wanted us to be doing it. So kind of along that parallel. And what I'm trying to figure out is kind of how to engage some of the local private practices because um, I, I think this intervention is probably more broad than just within my own academic practice. Well, I, I think maybe one of the, um, Brian, do you have funding for your project or is this, this is the proposal you're, you're writing, is that right? The proposal. And I think this relates to the question maybe Alex asked earlier. Do you, have you talked with your mentor about who you might target eventually for funding no, a study yet. like this? Okay. I'm not, I'm not asking to no, criticize, no, no. I'm just asking to explore. Because I think, um, you know, there are, there are some exciting ways you could potentially uh -huh. explore it. Um, and, and I think it's interesting to think about how you might scale your level engage, of engagement based on the budget that's allowed. So even in a question like this, it sounds like it's a, a pretty early question. I don't know, have you looked? Has there been other research in this area? So uh, can I interrupt? So I think this is great. I, I think it is a very nice uh, thing that uh, that research can be can be a common question between different people. So we had a similar interest in, uh, in uh, firearm uh, safety, and we actually had um, and uh, a presentation in the FMAC last FMAC was one of my uh, the one of our residents regarding uh, this. But the reason that it was raised up because um, since we have um, I do I do some geriatric and um, it became a big issue, especially with the uh, patients with dementia. 
uh, especially if they had uh, previously had firearms because later on you want to make sure that this is um, it becomes a safety issue so we did have uh, uh, a pre uh, like a, a presentation regarding safety and it's interesting that I, I heard that you were a pediatrician yes. is this uh, is this right and it is it is interesting that at the same time it, the extremes of, of life seems to be of an interest for uh, this specific study um, but um, again I'm, I don't think our 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 study was mainly ab about how what do people know about the uh, firearm safety and I think uh, I think this is one area that you can start with is uh, to uncover or discover how much of information does the actual uh, faculty and the residents know about uh, firearm safety and what approaches they um, they try to do because at certain point when it becomes a safety issue it is usually more complicated and uh, there is involvement from other um, from other uh, facilities to try to secure the the guns later on especially with dementia and end stage and dementia and from uh, stuff from that sort and um, it is definitely an issue because yeah it is it is kind of a political concern because sometimes it is you are not really um, the discussion is not really an easy discussion too so I think we're hearing from Tamir some uh, excitement for your research question which is great um, the other thing I think your question was how do I get outside of my own system how do I potentially recruit some clinicians to participate from other practices in the region and I'm wondering um, what I I mean what I would think to do is to approach the PBRN to explore who are the members of the network and are there some members as you know Beth had said are there some members who have expressed interest in a similar topic um, it, it might be easiest I think if you're able to find some partners potentially in a clinic or even other community stakeholders who are also interested in this topic and then to leverage that energy to think about how do you engage uh, individuals and it, it's often in qualitative work if, if um, you're doing this if you can find one key informant you can use a snowball approach to try and identify others who might be interested um, so I would I would encourage you to approach your PBRN for strategies I'm 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 assuming that they might have a structure similar to ours where where they might have some resources in place to help you strategize here so and uh, if you're still on I'd like to uh, kind of have you share your your comment about what you're you're hearing about uh, uh, the narrative Sure. Um, I think that you know finding meaning in practice is incredibly important for for physicians, and I, I think it's it's extra important for academic physicians when you know sometimes what we do seems very removed from from the world, and very important for community-based physicians who are sometimes overwhelmed. Um, I think by the mundane. Uh, you know, burden of suffering that they sort of witness on a daily basis. And so um, I think that um, the role of the PERC um, as being able to provide this sort of structure and pathway um, allowing a physician to find or a practitioner to find meaning in their work is just incredibly important and um, someone should probably study that you know, study the effect of, of uh, how important that is for, for uh, clinician researchers. But. So I, I think maybe in the interest of time, Anne, I think you gave a really nice closure, which is this idea of um, using research to inspire and to help people sustain and what can be really challenging situations or, or challenging environments and um, one of the articles that was a, an optional read was this study on um, reflections of practice-based researchers in terms of participating in studies and I think the findings here really speak to that in terms of um, competence autonomy and relatedness or really feeling like you belong being part of a network is an opportunity to belong so um, I, I guess in terms of final advice, I might ask LJ for his comments, but um, 
thinking about um, the meaning of the work that you do to the stakeholders you engage, I think, is one element. Um, thinking about resource allocation to make it feasible for those you're hoping to engage in the work to actually have protected time. Um, and then I think also one of the other comments that came up was around training. So obviously participating in this fellowship is a real opportunity to leverage um, some training. The other thing that, that might be worth thinking about or discussing at a different time is what are the roles for physician trained researchers and PhD trained researchers? How do we kind of leverage maybe some of the expertise and synergy of these partners as we're moving forward um, in this work together? So great discussion. We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. I, I really uh, really found it useful. Apologize for not getting through the slides, but actually I was glad we didn't get through the slides <laughs> because it was much better to hear. I uh, hear from you. I think the final word from, from my standpoint is build relationships. Uh, uh, much like the discipline of primary care is relationship based, the research that we do in this setting is uh, relationship based. And so take the time. Uh, you need to know uh, to learn methods and approaches to doing research, but uh, you've got to have those trusted relationships because you have to have a setting to do this research in. And, and it's all about uh, relationships and partnerships and so thanks for t uh, spending an hour and a half with us uh, today. I learned a lot from you and uh, and appreciate it. So we're going to sign off. If that's okay, Jim? Yeah, I'll, I'll just wrap up real quick with a couple of final comments. <clears throat> thanks uh, so much, LJ and Melinda. This was really, I think, the, 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 the approach we want to take with these mm -hmm. webinars much more interactive, and I think everyone appreciates that so much, in addition to the fantastic content that you shared. So thank you for being so responsive to some of the needs that were expressed about wanting these to be more interactive. And this was just a, a great, great uh, shift in that direction. Okay, so um, would it be okay also if, uh, if uh, fellows contact you and Melinda uh, if they have further questions, LJ because I, and Melinda, because I think this could go on for another hour probably. So would that be okay if they email you? Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're all in this together, and, uh, and so uh, our emails hopefully will be somewhere. Uh, follow them up. Follow them up. So Melinda is going through, and, and uh, yep, there they were. She got, there we go. So there's, the, uh, there's our email. Love to talk to you. Uh, uh, we were really excited about spending this time with you today. Great. Thank you for doing so. Really appreciate this. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, everyone. Um, next month, uh, December 17th, we're, we'll be hearing from Lindy Knox and Don Neese, who have a lot of expertise in doing participatory research in TBRNs. Lindy has, has done a great deal of really interesting participatory research, and Don Neese um, is going to talk about patient-centered outcomes research, which is um, highly relevant to PBRNs uh, today, as, as most of you know. Also, um, we're, we're, we're in the process of scheduling quarterly calls with each of you and your mentors. Several of those have been scheduled already. If you haven't heard from us yet, um, Amanda Ross will be in touch to schedule those calls. And these are just kind of touching base um, to see where you're at in the program. Do you have questions? Do you have needs that aren't being met? Are there things that we could be doing differently that would make this of, of greater value to you? Um, so these are um, just kind of checking in calls. So those will be happening in the next three weeks or so. Um, I sent a couple of messages last night, one about the learning plan. Um, so the learning plan is really just at this point going to be about your concept paper. And your concept paper is something that may shift as you engage your stakeholders. Um, so not asking or expecting you to have everything completely worked out at this point. But really what we want to see is do you have the process mapped out? so that you can realistically have a timeline that you can meet, um, at least projected timeline, so that you really appreciate kind of how many steps there are to doing this, what's involved, and, you know, this can change going forward. But um, just as a starting point for your concept paper, uh, that's, what those, that's why we were asking for this uh, around December 1st. 
So if you have questions about that or any of these other issues, um, please contact me or LJ um, and uh, let us know, you know, or give us a phone call and we'll be happy to discuss this. And again, we'll be having the quarterly calls with you real soon. Okay? All right. Um, don't want to keep folks longer than this, so thank you all for participating and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.